I'm Aaron Maté sitting in for Jimmy Dore. And uh, remember recently, Matt Taibbi testified before Congress and a member of Congress, a non-voting member of Congress named Stacey Plaskett, a Democrat, said this to him. Mr. Chairman, I'm not exaggerating when, when I say that you have called before you two witnesses who pose a direct threat to people who oppose them. That's a member of Congress saying that Matt Taibbi and an, another witness named Michael Schellenberger, two journalists, are a threat <laughs> to people who oppose them. And the reason why they're ostensibly a threat is because these two journalists have been reporting on the Twitter files, which reveal massive collaboration between the national security state and social media giants to police the Internet and censor dissent and push pro-state propaganda. So that's why this member of Congress is calling Matt Taibbi a threat to people who oppose him. Well, guess who now is threatening Matt Taibbi? Stacey Plaskett. Here's the headline from Lee, from journalist Lee Fong. House Democrat threatens Twitter files journalist with prosecution and imprisonment. Congress member Stacey Plaskett is threatening Matt Taibbi with imprisonment over his Twitter files testimony. Here's some of the letter. This is uh, sent on official congressional letterhead sent to Matt Taibbi. It says this, Dear Mr. Taibbi, I write regarding your appearance before the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Weaponization on March 9th. It has come to my attention that information foundational to your testimony that day has since been revealed to be false and misleading. At the beginning of the hearing, you swore under penalty of perjury that the testimony you were about to give was true and correct <clears throat> to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief. Under the federal perjury statute, Providing false information is punishable up to five by up to five years imprisonment. This is a member of Congress, a Democrat, telling a journalist that he committed perjury and he faces five years imprisonment for testimony, by the way, that was 100 percent factual. Now, let's bring in that journalist who's being threatened, Matt Taibbi. Uh, Matt writes at Racket News, which is on Substack, has been doing such important reporting on the Twitter files and is now being threatened with prison over it. Matt, welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. Thanks for having me on, Aaron. So talk to us about this threat you received. Uh, wh what is your reaction to it? Well, first of all, I didn't receive it. Uh, that's one of the odder parts about it. I'm, I'm supposed <laughs> to have answered seven questions no later than April 21st, 2023, which is today. And I never got this letter in the mail. It, I had to read about it in the news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's one thing. Um, you know, another thing is uh, I, I knew this was going to be a possibility. Like Lee, who who I think very adroitly, Lee Fong, who adroitly noted that as soon as um, MSNBC's Mehdi Hassan suggested that I uh, had lied under oath on Twitter, that this was a real possibility that somebody would take pick up that ball and run with it. Um, I, I immediately wondered about that. Um, I also wondered about it during the hearing because there were a lot of questions that were asked that seemed designed to get put us on the record about certain things like, you know, did, did we make money? Did we do this? Did we, um, you know, when did this happen? It was like they were trying to establish, uh, you know, what, what our version of events was um, and for later cross-examination. And maybe that sounds paranoid, but in, you know, in light of what what's happened, um, it's it's amazing. Um, I, the only Aaron, I think you would appreciate this. I, I first started drifting away, kind of, from mainstream journalism after Adam Schiff's um, famous hearing about uh, Russian active measures in March 2017. Do you remember that? That's when Adam Schiff, uh, I believe, read the Steele dossier, the collection of Clinton campaign funded conspiracy theories about Trump and Russia into the congressional record and yeah that's that's exactly right he, he did that i remember watching it on live tv i was you know like everybody else i was sort of glued to the screen and i had this thought to myself wow this must be true because no member of congress could read something like this into the record a prepared remarks um and not check it because at rolling stone at that time we even had a rule in the fact checking department that if if something was in a prepared congressional re uh, remark that you could use that as a way to check check a fact 
So I, I wrote to them, uh, to Schiff's office and asked if they had, you know, verified the, the story. And they said, we look forward to, to, to speaking with Mr. Steele to corroborate this information. So they hadn't even called Steele before they did that, that whole presentation. And this is the standard that they've been keeping and they want to put me in jail over a typo that they end up being wrong about. Um, I mean, look, I'm not going to downplay the, the mistake of killing myself over, uh, you know, those things I got wrong in, in the files. Cause it's opened up a whole conversation, but, um, on this point, they're, they're actually an error and, uh, it's just very frustrating and a little scary. This is the key point. They are threatening you with prison over a mistake that they've made. Uh, it's true, and you've corrected these mistakes. In, in your Twitter threads, you got an acronym wrong, and you corrected that. But they're saying you got it wrong in your congressional testimony, which you did not. Now, we're going to play that bit of your testimony, which Congress Member Plaskett cites in her note. But maybe set this clip up for us, um, because this comes down to basically two groups, CISA and CIS, very similar acronyms. Uh, one just doesn't have an A. One of them, CISA, is a government entity. The other one is a nonprofit, but it's also funded by the government. So set this clip up for us that Congress member Plaskett wrongly believes is a sign of you committing perjury. So I, I was trying to make the point that um, these entities, whether it's CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is a part of Homeland Security or the Center for Internet Security or the Election Integrity Partnership of Stanford. Um, I, I had seen so many of these, what they call escalations at Twitter, where it's complaints about content coming from one body or, or the other to Twitter to act on. Um, I, I had seen so many of those that, uh, and seen how they internally, they, they talked about these complaints that um, I knew that they didn't really distinguish between where a complaint was coming from or, or who had sent it. It was all basically one entity to them. At least that was the impression that was given off in the documents. And this is what I was trying to express in this testimony, is that these acronyms were basically interchangeable. Got it. So let's go to a clip uh, of that testimony, which Congress Member Plaskett falsely says and is an example see in the of Twitter getting files is that Twitter executives did not distinguish between DHS or CISA and this group EIP. For instance, we would see a communication that said, um, from CISA escalated by <coughs> EIP. So they were essentially identical in the eyes of the company. Uh, EIP, uh, in, by its own data, and this is in reference to what, what you brought up, Mr. Congressman, um, according to their own data, they significantly uh, targeted more dis what they call disinformation on the right than on the left um, by a factor, I think, of about, of about 10 to 1. Uh, so, and I, and I say that it's not a Republican at all. It's just a fact of what we're looking at. Um, so, yes, we, the, we have come to the, to the realization that th this bright line that we imagine that exists between, say, the FBI or the DHS or the GEC and these private companies is, is illusory and that it's, what's more important is this constellation of kind of quasi private organizations that do this work. So Congress member Plaskett's letter to you, this is the only part of your testimony that she cites. Uh, so she's saying that this is perjury here. And what's interesting is she makes clear what her source is. It's the Mehdi Hassan show on MSNBC because Mehdi, after he did this interview with you, started bragging that he caught you in all these errors, which in fact he didn't. Uh, the one he caught it, me in a couple. Let's be he, fair. I he mean, caught you in a couple of of minor errors that are completely irrelevant, like the, which is bound to happen in reporting. That's what happens. But he bragged that this discredited the whole thing, and this was used toward that end. And so now Congressman Plaskett has picked up on that, on something that was actually not an error in Congress. It was an error in one of your tweets where you got an acronym wrong. But Mehdi was saying that you had that you had made these false statements under oath. So she's picking up on that. And she writes this: the above statements now seem to be contradicted by your own admission. On April 6, 2023, you appeared for an interview on the Mehdi Hassan show on MSNBC. During that interview, Mr. Hassan pointed out that your March 9th tweet added a parenthetical A to the acronym CIS 
changing the meaning of the term from Center for Internet Security, a private organization, to cybersecurity and infrastructure security <laughs> agency. Okay. So the, she's even citing you getting it wrong in a tweet. What? A tweet right there. A tweet. Not even in your congressional testimony, but because Mehdi was bragging on Twitter that, that or claiming on Twitter that you had falsely uh, characterized CIS in your congressional testimony, she's she's running with that. Wouldn't they? I mean, that seems like a that's pretty thin of a thing to threaten over because you would have to prove you intentionally put an A. Exactly. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I, how would that even get a, anywhere past well, this? I, I, I can see how they I can see how they make this mistake. So, so if CISA was not involved with the election integrity partnership, if D, if there was no DHS entity involved in this at all, and all I had was an image that said from CIS, uh, from EIP by way of CIS, and I added an A to it, um, then they would be like, then they would be probably correct in saying, oh, he's trying to imply that there's an intelligence agency involved when it's just a civil society organization. But there are actually, there are two things wrong with that. There are two big things wrong with that per perception. One is that uh, CISA, CIS, and EIP are all openly partners. I mean, they've... <laughs> It's on. It's on the EIP <clears throat> website. It says EIP. You know, EIP partnered with CISA in 2020. It's on the CIS website uh, that CIS and CISA were working together to you know combat disinformation. Um, CIS is actually a DHS contractor um, that uh, you know had, had publicly received almost 38 million dollars that year from DHS. Uh, and I had even warned, I guess, in hindsight, myself in an earlier Twitter files thread that these acronyms were easy to confuse because they were all, they, That's right. they're all, uh, Homeland Security contractors working together with the, with the EIP. So if, if you didn't know that they, that CISA and EIP were partners, this would look diabolical. But the problem is it only takes like a second to fig to learn that, that, that that's not the case and they they haven't done that and uh, Matt you point this out in your latest piece which is called House Democrats have lost their minds and you know all of this the fact that we're talking about acronyms and literally one letter in an acronym uh, that is different it speaks to how desperate your critics are to distract from the actual issues which is the substance of your reporting on the Twitter files which reveal so much about how the internet is policed and censored in the interest of the national security state. And because House Democrats and MSNBC have no interest in actually looking at that and actually every interest in covering it up, they want to focus on these trivial things such as like the, the acronym. So here, again, here it is, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and a, at a nonprofit group called the Center for Internet Security. And as you point out, as you, as you just mentioned, you've noted before, well before this whole uh, thing blew up, you said – you know how confusing it is. Um, it's on purpose, in, in part obviously. Be, in, well, in part because not only are the acronyms similar, <laughs> but also CIS is a Department of Homeland Security contractor. That's you pointing that out back in December 2022, well before MSNBC deployed a team of Comcast-funded producers to try to find any error they could in your reporting. And here's some more examples. The uh, Election Integrity Project partnered with CISA in 2020. And look, here's a headline. Uh, CIS and CISA to block malicious websites for state local government. So that's an example of them working together. So it's a distinction, really, I think, in this case, without a difference. And again, here's more from CIS. Federally funded cybersecurity nonprofit, the Center for Internet Security, has teamed up with CISA. So they're admitting it themselves. And here's that $38 million grant that the CIS, this nonprofit but government-funded group, has gotten from the Department of Homeland Security. So... Matt, you know, going through this now, uh, and you've also really recently had an experience where on the day you were testifying before Congress, some IRS agents visited your home, and maybe that was just a complete coincidence. I don't know. But <laughs> but overall, I mean, your thoughts on, on what threats like this, uh, how that can impact journalism? Well, I'm sure it's going to be scary for anybody who is going to consider doing this kind of work going forward. Uh, I mean, look – this is the scary part of journalism generally. Like before you even get to 
the the idea of somebody trying to put you in prison for this kind of stuff um at time was this kind of work like you know I, I i mentioned this in one of my one of my articles like um in my book the divide i did a long chapter on uh the shenanigans that took place uh, after the bankruptcy of lehman brothers and when you're trying when you're doing stuff like that that's like really really difficult arcane legalistic <clears throat> you, i'm not a lawyer you're going into a field that you don't know uh, nearly as much about as as the people that you're reporting on um and you're trying to convey something to the general public it's always very very difficult to to you know you're flying blind a little bit right you're gonna you're you're making kind of educated guesses about what what's right and what's wrong based on thing, you know, sort of confirmable facts that you can grab hold of. And then, you know, you try to interpret it for, for, for mass audiences. That's a very, very difficult job already because it's already laden with the possibility that you can be wrong about things and it's embarrassing professionally, which is why there's not a lot of, as you know, Aaron, like high level investigative reporting. It's like, the, it's, it's kind of a low reward activity to begin with. But if you add on top of that, the idea that someone's going to threaten you with, you know, imprisonment or, you know, you take the worst case scenario, someone like Assange, um, you, you know, who's going to bother with this? Because it's always it's there's always going to be the possibility that you're going to make some kind of mistake doing uh, difficult work, sorting out secret things where sources don't talk to you. I mean, <laughs> that possibility always exists. So. Yeah, I think it's chilling. I'm sorry, that's a long-winded answer. No, it's yes. not. And look, speaking of chilling, uh, Lee Fong, who's an investigative reporter who's done now uh, m multiple articles on this whole episode, uh, debunking Mehdi Hassan's claims about you, uh, pointing out that Mehdi Hassan is in fact a plagiarist, uh, among other things. Uh, but also he now reports that while the letter uh, to you, and you're now telling us that you haven't even received this letter, which is crazy in itself, but this letter that was addressed to you uh, – authored by Stacey Plaskett, actually did not just come from her office because uh, he reveals that actually it comes from uh, that the metadata on the letter and people who were involved in sending, sending the letter were not just Stacey Plaskett, but also people close to Jerry Nadler, the former mm -hmm. chair of the House <clears throat> Judiciary Committee, and also Hakeem Jeffries, who's the right. leader of the Democrats inside the House. So this is not just one member of Congress. This is the leadership of House Democrats going after you here and threatening you with prison. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know what to think about that. Uh, I really don't. I mean, this is like Scientology it, stuff they're doing to you. It's like when you turn on Scientology and they send <laughs> people to screw yeah, with you. I mean, it's, it's not just this. All the things IRS thing. These are all a concentrated thing to like shove you around with the power of government. It's pretty wild. Yeah, they're trying to turn me, I guess, into a suppressive person. Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, you're a threat. Uh, you're going to end up doing push-ups in a closet in some place. <laughs> whatever the punishment is for, for that stuff. No, it's weird. And, and it is, it, it's, it's funny that you say that because this is, it's like a cult-like activity, what they're talking about. Um, you know, no, no normal person with a conscience would think about doing this. Um, it, it, like, for one person to have this idea is already a little bit nuts, but for multiple people in positions of authority who are elected um, and can easily check to see what the actual facts of the situation are uh, to do this means that they must all be in some collective mindset that I, I really don't understand. I mean, I, it, there, there's a level of like hatred and malevolence uh, here that is... Uh, a little well, mysterious. I mean, you, I'd be curious to hear what you think, about dude. That. It's because you got uh, this. Uh, when I went through this kind of in uh, back in 2015 with the whole press, it it's like a position where you're suddenly in a campaign to be elected to like live your life. Not, yep. Yep. and so what they're doing is their political games. That's like perfectly normal in DC. Now they now do that to everybody, yep. especially the, that's how like like I guess how was slippery the grasp is that they have to do like camp like dirty campaign tactics to people that aren't running for anything the threatening a journalist with imprisonment is unprecedented at least to a u.s journalist obviously we've seen them cage julian assange but threatening is this a, putin stuff i thought this was putin this does. is supposed to be putin stuff exactly and you know 
Well, you guys talked about this being cult behavior. Yeah, the cult is called Blue Anon. Uh, and I think they're the most dangerous cult in the world. They worship the national security state. Uh, they believe in deranged conspiracy theories about Russia, whether it's that Russia has blackmailed Trump and his associates, that Russia has put bounties on U.S. troops in Afghanistan, that Russia has sent has used microwave weapons to injure U.S. diplomats and intelligence officials, uh, that Russia is behind Hunter Biden's laptop, on and on and on. And anybody who de- deviates from the cult gets called names and now gets even threatened in the case of an award-winning journalist like Matt Taibbi gets threatened with prison. Dude, they all know. And then the ones that aren't directly in on it all know not to like talk too much. The, the pipeline thing is my favorite because I got all kinds of friends that work a bunch of news places and they all... I'll be like, North Stream too. Yeah, North Stream. Yeah. I go, hey, who do you think did that? And like, well, I think it's a coin flip. And they know who did it. They're terrified to to say that openly because they all know. Matt, any more words you want to say about the mistake that they made here in this letter to you before we move on to the next segment? Yeah, I mean, th- there's kind of a um, there's kind of an amazing thing that she writes <laughs> in here. Um, the mistake is important because by adding an A, you weren't making a harmless spelling error. Error. Rather, you are alleging that CISA, a government entity, was working with the EIP to have posts removed from social media. When presented with this misinformation, you acknowledge that you had made an error. Um, and then she goes on to say that I intentional that I acknowledge intentionally making an error, which I I didn't. But by saying that CISA is working with EIP is misinformation. Like that itself is a, is a glaring error. That's a glaring conceptual error, like a major one, as opposed to what we're talking about. You know, with with this, with the missed acronym. I mean, the, that's the troubling part about this whole thing is that if if we were all being human beings here, if we were all just trying to hash it out, it, like we would have a rational discussion about. <clears throat> We disagree and then we could we could not do stuff like this we could just say oh by the way you're wrong about this so i'm sorry you know and but no i mean they're they're gonna they're doing this wrong thing and then they're they're gonna double down on it i guess uh hey, you're in a campaign dude it's not like normal it's not like a every industry we have pierre cory on talking about how he got hammered uh after with covid and all like I mean, you showed it in twitter files the amount of effort they yeah. went through to suppress people and like Doctors that are respected doctors are suddenly fringe. If you're a member of Congress, I wonder if you can face prison time for threatening someone someone else with prison time based on a egregious error. I wonder if that's uh, on the books yet. If not, we should look into that maybe. We're telling jokes in Nashville, Honolulu, Los Angeles, Northampton, Massachusetts, Syracuse, Cohoes, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Baltimore, Chicago, Rosemont, San Diego, and more. Go to JimmyDoor.com to see, get a link for all those tickets. Plus, you can watch my new special, COVID Lies Are Funny. <laughs> <laughs> 